Hello, math fans. I'm Martin Hellman. I'm a professor at Stanford University. I'm here in Heidelberg because of the Heidelberg Laureate Forum, and I'm here with Tom Crawford. Perfect. And we're going to talk about whatever we talk about. We are indeed. <laughs> we are hopefully going to talk about your incredibly interesting career. Uh, I've, I've been really, really looking forward to, to having this opportunity to talk with you on camera because I think the variety of things you've looked at is just amazing. It's amazing to me. If someone had told me when I was 20 years old that I'd have the life I, I've had, uh, I would have said no, no, no many times over. Yeah. <laughs> so just for ease of reference for the viewers, let's sort of go back to the 70s. The, the reason we are, of course, in Heidelberg is you received the Turing Award your work on public key cryptography along with um, other contributors, which we're going to talk about. Um, so can you just kind of paint the scene of how you got involved in that problem, who you were working with, just kind of okay. give us the, the overview of what was going on at that time okay. period. 1966 to 68, I was doing my graduate work at Stanford in information theory, and uh, I just thought I was going to do information theory. 1968 to 69, I was at IBM Research. They just started their cryptographic research effort. It was in the same department as me. I was not doing it. But I met Horst Feistel, who mm -hmm. was there, the father of IBM's cryptographic effort. And he gave me lots of information. That, and also I saw IBM spending money, which reinforced my belief that there was a commercial uh, market for encryption. Then 1969 to 1971, I taught at MIT. Mm -hmm. And Peter Elias, who was one of the original contributors to information theory, gave me Claude Shannon's 1949 paper, which was little known at the time, probably little known today, which related information theory to cryptography. And it actually is a declassified version of his 1945 classified report, so it actually in many ways preceded his work on information theory, if, if your viewers know about that. Mm -hmm. That was 1948. So you sort of, these things all were, were happening around you and you thought, Oh, I would like to get so, involved with this? Or? Well, that's what, when, I, when Peter gave me uh, Claude Shannon's paper, I realized that maybe I could do something in cryptography. Yeah. And so I started out, and I was stealing time to do it. And then in the, the fall of 1974, I, I'm almost certain it was, Whit Diffie shows up on my doorstep. Basically, I'd gone to IBM Research maybe six months earlier, and I wanted to talk with them, but a secrecy order had descended. They told me oh, they can't tell me very much anymore which shows up a few months later, they tell him the same thing, but they add one key point. Oh, by the way, when you're back at Stanford, because he'd worked at Stanford's AI lab, look up Hellman, he was here saying some similar things. They didn't say ridiculous things, but I think that's what they thought. <laughs> and so which shows up on my doorstep, uh, he calls me, we set up maybe a half hour meeting, and after an hour or two, uh, let's see, it's 1974, so my kids are three and five years old. Mm -hmm. I tell it, I want to continue the conversation, but I promised my wife I'd be home to watch the kids. We can talk. Uh, they'll be playing, but it's on campus. Do you mind? He came back. He invited Mary, later his wife, mm -hmm. and she since passed, of course. Uh, and we invited them to dinner, and they left at 11 o'clock. Very welcome. And that began a great uh, two years. And then it got old. Uh, uh, I was a year younger than Witt, and he had a bachelor's degree in math from MIT. I was an assistant or an associate professor, so he was working under me, and that did not work well. I mean, he needed to be his own person, and so after a couple of years, he went out on his own and established his own reputation. But we did fantastic things in those two years, and I'm very grateful that Witt is in my life. And the Turing Award has brought us back together again. Uh, we were living kind of separately, but then we ended up doing things together. And also, I did with Wit what I did with many people. There have been some periods in my life when Wit was a pain in the ass, and I'm sure he, I was to him. Uh, but I remember thinking, is my life better off for having had Wit in it or not? And the clear answer was absolutely. And so mm -hmm. I need to take all of Wit. Uh, and fortunately, he was willing to take all of me, and we're good friends again. Fantastic. Um, and then sort of as a result of, of your work around cryptography, something you mentioned in your lightning talk oh. earlier this week, which just to me sounds like a fascinating story. So I will link to the lightning talk um, okay. in the okay. description for the viewers. But you talked about um, why friends were better than enemies. So at the data encryption standard, which was an early encryption system, was promulgated in 1975. It didn't actually mm -hmm. become a standard till later. We were naive enough to think that it was that it, when it was proposed, Witt and I were naive enough to think that it, it was actually a proposed standard, which they called it. Once it's in the Federal Register, it's in concrete. Mm -hmm. 
And as we looked at it, we saw several potential problems, but the biggest one was that the key size was 56 bits. Nominally, it was 64, but they threw, the first thing they did was throw away eight bits, and we started, right, I, we wrote letters to N, uh, the National Bureau of Standards, as it was then called, because mm -hmm. uh, it was cheap to increase the key size, and it was necessary to increase the key size. Uh, so with two to the 56 keys, you have 100,000 million million keys, roughly. Mm -hmm. We proposed a, an exhaustive search machine, which is the simplest of all cryptanalytic approaches. A chip would search a million keys per second. A million chips would search a million million keys per second. It would take 100,000 seconds or a little more than a day to search 100,000 million million keys, which is what the key space. And this was obvious, even if it wasn't possible in 1975, although we mm -hmm. thought it was, it would certainly be possible by 1980 because Moore's law was advancing computational mm -hmm. speed by a factor of 10 every five years in those days. So we were shocked when, and it was surprised, maybe even shocked when NBS did not respond to this, the Bureau mm -hmm. of Standards, and they basically waved it off. So I did a little more, I started to do more, and this was a funny thing. Witt was technically my student, although as I've said, <laughs> Witt can be no one's student. Uh, he's too independent. And usually it's the professor who's very busy with doing many things and it's the student who does all the legwork. Mm -hmm. I actually did most of the legwork. Witt has said, he's better at coming up with ideas, I'm better at actually implementing them, something like that. And so I went to our integrated circuits lab, I started refining the estimate and it became clear this was a problem. And thus developed a war with NSA, the American National Security Agency, the American equivalent of GCHQ. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, in January 1976, there was a famous meeting at Cable Data, which you might be able to link to as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and two people from NSA flew out and told us, you're wrong, but please be quiet. If you continue talking this way, you're gonna cause grave harm to national security. What they really meant is you're right, but please be quiet, yeah. and so on. And so um, we decided to go public with the uh, controversy, and a war ensued. This was the first crypto war, as I call it. And NSA and I were enemies. Mm -hmm. And in March, in, I forget exactly when in 78, or probably early in 78, I get a call from the director's office at NSA. And by the way, the joke is that NSA stands for, doesn't stand for National Security Agency, it stands for no such agency and never say <laughs> anything. So uh, the woman at the other end said, uh, the director, Admiral Bobby Inman, was going to be in California, would I be willing to meet with him? And I'd never, we'd never really had a, even though the war was with NSA, it was always with proxies. So I jumped at the opportunity. Inman came to my office at Stanford and uh, uh, it was a very cautious meeting at first, but he, the first, one of the first things he did is he looked up at my head and he said, it's nice to see you don't have horns. Because <laughs> I was being depicted as the devil yeah. at MIT. Mm -hmm. I looked back at him and I said, same here. I actually had been thinking more in terms of Star Wars. I was 30 year, roughly 30 years old at the time, early 30s. So I, I vision, envisioned myself as Luke Skywalker to NSA's <laughs> Darth Vader. And the second yeah. thing Inman said is, I'm here, I need to tell you, I'm here against the advice of all the other senior people at the agency, but I don't see the harm in talking. And he's an out-of-the-box thinker. Mm -hmm. And so he, that, out of that cautious meeting, an enemy was turned into a friend. And by the way, notice that it was Admiral Inman who initiated it. Mm -hmm. So you can really believe me, I'm not the good guy here, it's Admiral Inman. And he is a good friend. He's in his, now, he's in his 90s, uh, but he signed several statements of support, several letters, one that we're working on now that I won't go into. Uh, and he would, as I said in the lightning talk, he wouldn't have signed the letters if he didn't agree with them, but he also wouldn't have signed them if he did, if I was an enemy, he wouldn't, yeah. if I was the devil incarnate, I'm gonna just twist it. So friends are better than enemies. Yeah, um, if I can just ask one main question that jumps out at me from that really interesting, fascinating story. Were you not, Worried, afraid, scared even, that the NSA were like going to war with you? My mother called me, my mother was still alive, and said, what are you doing? You're gonna get yourself killed. Because mm. uh, I was, oh, by the way, I was pissing off not just NSA, I was pissing off a number of their foreign equivalents. Uh, yeah. And some of my, uh, Silicon Valley is also known as Spook Valley, as you probably know, because much of the early money for Silicon Valley came from NSA and the CIA. Yeah. Uh, 
And some of my friends worked in intelligence matters. Some of them warned me that I should not be doing what I'm doing, that my, I was risking my life. Others told me this was crazy. I don't know who's right. Yeah. But my wife was really happy when this made big news because she said, now if something happens to you, there will be an investigation. The good news is nothing happened to me. I'm here. Yeah. Uh, I wasn't arrested. I wasn't killed. So it worked out well. But yeah. yeah. I, I mean, I'm a, I, by the way, I grew up in the Bronx. And uh, <laughs> what I realized later is I was never a very good street fighter. But I, so I fought with my mouth and my mind, which actually made the other kids in the neighborhood want to beat me up probably. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but NSA picked the wrong person. Uh, yeah. I mean, initially, we, I was, as I said, I was naive enough to think this was a bug rather than a feature from their point yeah. of view. But once it was clear that we had a war, I wasn't going to back away from it. Yeah. And it wasn't, cur it wasn't courage. It was, one could say it was arrogance. And that's a right. whole other story. Arrogance is part of my dark side, I, and there's a whole story in the book about a, Jew, an, a man who impressed me as an arrogant Jewish professor from New York. I'm Jewish, I'm a professor, I'm from New York, and arrogance was too much to add to the mix. And uh, the good news is I have come to embrace my dark side, hmm. and I now see arrogance and courage as being on a spectrum. Yeah. And so you can't be courageous without occasionally appearing arrogant. And so if my wife now were to tell me that I was appearing arrogant instead of getting mad at her, I would, dial it, I would dial back a little bit because I might not see it as arrogant, but if she saw it that way, some other people would. Good to dial back a little bit. First quick fire question. Can you remember the first piece of code you ever wrote? I can remember the first piece of code I didn't write. I went to Bronx High School of Science, 1959 to 1962. We had an IBM 1620 computer before most colleges did. IBM mm -hmm. must have donated it. Uh, and I wouldn't go anywhere near it because I thought you needed to be some kind of weird math genius to program a computer. And especially at Bronx Science, I didn't think of myself that way. There was a kid who was in junior high school with me, so mm -hmm. it wasn't just Bronx Science, it was the neighborhood junior high even before, who was head and shoulders above me in math. He's now worth $4 billion, by the way. <laughs> so does that, is that a good enough answer to that, that one? That is a great answer, that is a great answer, yes. It almost felt like, was there a switch in the 80s to thinking about international security? Or were you doing that alongside? No, abs no absolutely, it was a switch. Okay. Um, we got married, my wife and I got married in 1967. We were madly in love. I wasn't gonna get married till I was 35. I got married when I was 20. When you meet the right person, yeah. things change. But 10 years later, my wife was ready to leave me, but I didn't know it because I had blinders on, as many husbands do, mm -hmm. and I was too busy. Uh, fortunately, she remembered that I was, when she met me, and these are her words, I was the one. I was still the one, even though life with me was impossible. So she decided she was going to stay and she was going to get it right. Mm -hmm. So uh, Dorothy, my wife, was working as a, you would call it a chartered accountant, a CPA, mm -hmm. uh, auditing companies with one of the very large accounting firms, now Deloitte Touche. And one of the partners and his wife was in this crazy organization from our then perspective. They were counting how many aluminum cans they'd recycled, how many gallons of gasoline they used each month. We thought it was good to be concerned about the environment, but this was a bit much. Anyway, John, the partner, says to Dorothy, how would you and Marty like to go to a, this is 1980, mm -hmm. how would you and Marty like to go to a weekend seminar on the bigger issues of life? Dorothy is looking for catalysts to change the relationship because she has no idea how to build the kind of relationship we now have. Mm -hmm. Her parents didn't have it. My parents didn't have it. We never saw it in society. But she's a very sensitive person. And she, so she jumps at the opportunity, drags me along, I go not quite kicking and screaming. She drags me to meetings, uh, weekly meetings, for about six months. And uh, after six months, I start to see that these people know something I need to learn if my marriage is going to survive. This is 1980 into 1981. Mm -hmm. They always worked at the micro level and the macro level. The micro level for us was making peace in our marriage. The macro level started with environment, then it became nuclear weapons when Ronald Reagan became president in 1981. And as we researched the threat posed by nuclear weapons, we came to a startling conclusion. You mm -hmm. couldn't solve the problem just by getting rid of nuclear weapons. That wouldn't solve the problem. It's mm -hmm. not gonna happen either in this yeah. current environment. You needed to really build a better foreign policy. You needed to build a world, as we called it in those days, beyond war. Mm -hmm. Nuclear weapons had made war too dangerous. It had made war obsolete we said, but not extinct. And our job was to educate the public on the risk, mm -hmm. which I'm still doing, as you know, yes. uh, trying to educate the public and trying to get people to realize that the nuclear threat 
viewed from a different angle as the nuclear opportunity to finally build the kind of world we've always dreamed of but thought ourselves incapable of building. We're either going to do it or we're going to die. Second question, do you have a favorite number? I have a favorite number. It is uh, eight, and it's because it was my older brother's favorite number. And when I was a small child, I, my older brother died uh, almost, almost exactly a year ago, right after his 80th birthday. Mm -hmm. But uh, as a kid, especially, he was my hero. And anything he had, I wanted. So he used to say, I used to say, would you sell me that? <laughs> and his, his answer always was, sure. Well, how much? Uh, I, so I said, how much? And he'd always say, how much do you have? Yeah. Uh, so his favorite number was eight. Actually, I don't. Today, my favorite number, uh, probably two to the two hundred and fiftieth power, which is bigger than any than the number of elementary particles in the known universe. Love it. So it was be, it was beyond war. Created this group that got me working on these issues, and I actually dropped my work on mathematics. What was the point in proving theorems if there wasn't anyone likely to be anyone around fifty to hundred years from now to appreciate it? My advisor tried telling me, he said, look, Marty, uh, Tom, he was a colleague at that point, he said, you're so good at research, you could spend half your time on research, half your time doing this, yep. and you still do good research. But I just wanted to work on this issue. Mm -hmm. And I, this is my almost full-time uh, job these days, uh, mm -hmm. is working on this issue. I don't get paid for doing it, but it's what I love doing. Yeah. No, it's good that you sort of, it feels as though you found, just listening to you talk, it feels like you found the thing that you really care about and want to put your energy into. Yeah. As you say, so. No, I, I mean, what, 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 researchers love problems that everybody else is neglecting that have strong uh, implications. What, everybody's, <laughs> unfortunately, everybody's neglecting it. I wish I could take a vacation, but right now I'm, I, I've, I have a, a researcher's dream, a, huma, a human being's nightmare. Yeah, yeah. And um, there are, of course, I, of course, look to the website, which again, we will link in the video mm. description. Um, there are some sort of uh, quantitative calculations that you've done around mm -hmm. nuclear risk. So I particularly enjoyed, well, not enjoyed reading, but seeing the visualization that you came up with in that short video around um, the risk is sort of similar to imagining your house being surrounded by a thousand oh, nuclear that one. power plants. Yes. So that was an old one. Uh, it's a very primitive video, but mm. uh, it works. Um, power plants, nuclear power plants are designed at least in the West, to a minimum of a million mean time, a million years mean time between fail, mean time to failure, yeah. and my estimate is that the mean time to failure of nuclear deterrence is about a hundred years, so that's ten thousand times. To, to be a little bit generous, I say thousands of nuclear weapons, thousands of nuclear power plants. I say, imagine a nuclear power plant built next to your house. You'd get very, right next to your house, in your yep. backyard, you'd get very concerned. But it's not just one, it's two, three, four, and it goes yep. pop, 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 until yep. there are a thousand, and it's actually more than a thousand. Yep. Another analogy is, imagine a man wearing a TNT vest would have come and sit down at that uh, sofa over there and say, Tom, Marty, don't move. Uh, I'm not a suicide bomber. I don't have the buttons for setting these explosives off. There's one button in Washington with President Biden that had been with President Trump, who were both cautious men. The other button is in Moscow with President Putin, a nice cautious man, don't worry about Ukraine. Uh, and yes, there are buttons in other cities. Still, we would get out of here as fast as we could. Yeah. And so what I say is just because we can't see the weapons controlled by those buttons, why have we sat here complacently assuming because the Earth's, ex Earth's explosive vest has not yet gone off, it never will? as if confronted with the guy wearing the TNT vest, we need to be plotting an escape route. Mm -hmm. And when I used that analogy once in a House office building at the U.S. House of Representatives talking to some people, I said, plotting an escape route does not mean jumping out the window. We're on the fourth floor and killing ourselves. It means plotting an escape route. We need to start thinking this thing through. We need to stop killing people without thinking about it as we did in Iraq and Vietnam mm -hmm. and as Britain did many places yep. uh, and as Russia is doing today uh, and the U.S. is helping the Ukrainians kill a lot of Russians. Uh, we, need to, we need a new, a new mode of thinking, as Einstein said. Couldn't agree more. Um, and brings on to the, the final sort of story, I guess, uh, or milestone that, that I found particularly interesting looking at your sort of career and, and achievements. Um, is your recent, does it count, seven years ago book that you co-authored? It was seven wife, years ago, exactly. Dorothy, that you mentioned. So 
it's, if I've understood correctly, it's around how you can use um, peace at home as like a... Well, the subtitle describes it, creating true love at home and peace on the planet. And it yes. comes, you can see it growing out of what we learned in this group, which we left yeah. uh, before it ended and it no longer exists. So we're not recruiting for the group, uh, but it worked on the micro and the macro. And we see it, that makes a lot of, it made a lot of sense to me then and it still makes sense to me now. Uh, and we summarize it with a sound bite, which is get curious, not furious. Mm -hmm. So as I said, when Dorothy used to do things that seemed crazy to me, I used to treat her like she was crazy, drove her crazy, convinced me I was right. Now I go to her and I, I say, as I said, I ask her questions. I get curious instead of furious. Mm -hmm. She does the same with me. And it's what we need internationally. Mm -hmm. Getting rid of the weapons will probably happen eventually, but let's not worry about that. The first step is to start asking why did Putin invade Ukraine? It was wrong, don't get me wrong. Don't, yeah. I mean, it was wrong. It was bad, it was a horrible humanitarian disaster with a lot of nuclear risk, but the West is not uh, blameless there either. And as evidence, um, there is a poll that was done in Ukraine by the University of Chicago that I've confirmed by talking to one of the lead researchers there, so I know, and it's on, the, it's on the Wall Street Journal website, but never mm -hmm. reported on by them, they sponsored it. And it found 85% of Ukrainians after the war started in Ukraine, 85% of Ukrainians not surprisingly blame Russia for the war. And I, I agree. 70% yep. also hold their own government responsible and 58% hold the US responsible. And it, what we need to do is instead of just saying that's ridiculous, we need to say, why is that? They didn't ask the people why they said that, but I can see lots of reasons. It's usually said that Putin's invasion of Ukraine was unprovoked. That's not true. It was provoked, mm -hmm. but it was unjustified. Mm -hmm. And there's a big difference between the two. Okay, and um, final question. Spaces or tabs? Spaces or tabs. I use both. I, I, I actually don't see... Sometimes tabs work better and sometimes spaces. You need to use what works. Okay, okay. So I, that last one in particular, I've, it's very, very... You're the first person who has not laughed and said, obviously, spaces. Oh. <laughs> so it's very interesting. So I've asked this to several people in maths and computer science, and the overriding opinion seems to be in favor of spaces. Well, actually, I come to think of it, I sometimes will add spaces because when I'm trying to get things to line up, uh, uh, sometimes I need to add some spaces. Mm. So maybe no, I, no I, to but, be fair, I think I agree with you. You use the thing that feels most appropriate. Yeah. Why limit yourself to one or the other? Okay. All right, awesome. Well, thank you so much. And thank you for doing this. Uh, uh, I knew it took time out, but it was well worth it. Yeah, no, it, it's, you, as I said, I was looking forward to it. It didn't disappoint. It was so much fun. Um, so again, thank you. I hope you enjoyed it. I did. Thank you everyone uh, for watching. <laughs> I will link everything we've mentioned in the video description. So do check out Martin's book and various other talks and videos. It's all there for you to find on YouTube and free PDFs and whatnot. And if you have enjoyed this video, please do remember to subscribe to the channel, like, share, the usual thing. Um, but again, Spend money. <laughs> also that, I wouldn't complain at that. <laughs> but thank you, and I'll see you soon.